Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, we're gonna get started here and I'm gonna give about 30 more seconds because people are still uh, filing into our Zoom room here. So sit tight, 30 more seconds and we'll get started. All right, let's get started. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today from wherever you are in the world. Uh, we've got a nice crowd already, and I see more people still coming in, but we've got a really uh, exciting agenda today, so I want to go ahead and get started. Um, and we're really excited to have you with us for what I think is going to be a very special uh, gender-based violence task force event. My name is Rose Wilcher, and I'm going to introduce and moderate our event today. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm with FHI 360, and I co-chair the GBV task force, along with Stephanie Perlman from Population Reference Bureau. And the GBV task force is part of USAID's Interagency Gender Working Group, the IGWG, and we are supported by USAID's Office of Population and Reproductive Health. Okay, so today's event is very special for two reasons. Um, first, it has been a good long time since the GBV task force has convened an event. We typically try and, and convene knowledge exchange events like this on a quarterly basis. And in fact, we originally intended to hold this particular event back in April. But just as we were beginning to plan it, the world changed and we, we pressed pause while we got our bearings. Since then, of course, we've all been reading countless stories about the ways in which the COVID-19 pandemic is exacerbating gender-based violence against the world. Um, but we've also seen individuals and institutions working in this space really respond with incredible resilience, um, among many things, putting out an array of programmatic and technical resources and guidance to, to help each other address the really urgent sexual and reproductive health and, and GBV needs of women and girls at this time. So to that end, I, I do just want to flag that one of the things the GBV task force has, has done in the past couple of months is to write a piece highlighting some of these important resources that have come into our inboxes over the last few months for addressing gender-based violence in the time of COVID. Um, and maybe we can, we can drop the link to that in the chat just so, so you know where it is. But the second and really the main reason today's event is so special is because it is a chance to learn about an incredibly important project called What Works to Prevent Violence Against Women and Girls. So What Works a program funded by the United Kingdom's Department for International Development from December 2013 through March 2020. And this program worked in 15 countries across Africa and Asia to build the evidence base on drivers of violence against women and girls and what works to prevent violence against women and girls. Mm -hmm. And we are really lucky to have the leadership from this program with us today to share some of the key findings from this expansive portfolio of research and engage with us in a discussion around the implications for policy and practice. So we're planning for a 90 minute session today, which should allow time for presentations. We have a couple of quick polling questions for all of you joining us after the presentations and then some Q&A with the presenters. However, as we go along, please feel free to type your comments or questions in the chat and we'll do our best to get to some of those during the discussion. So let's get right to it. I'm going to quickly introduce the presenters and then I will get out of the way and hand it over to them. 
So first up, we're going to have Professor Rachel Jukes. So Rachel is an executive scientist with the South African Medical Research Council and the former consortium director for What Works to Prevent Violence Against Women and Girls. And Rachel is going to give us sort of the, the, the big picture of the big picture the top line findings from across this massive portfolio of research in 15 countries over seven years. Um, Rachel will be followed by Dr. Andrew Gibbs, who is a senior specialist scientist with the South African Medical Research Council, and he's going to take us through the results of a randomized control trial um, evaluating an intervention called Stepping Stones and Creating Futures. And then Andy will be followed by Samantha Willen, who is a capacity development specialist and gender-based violence researcher with the South African Medical Research Council. And she's gonna present the results from some qualitative research that was conducted alongside the Stepping Stones and Creating Futures randomized controlled trial and give us an in-depth look at young women's reproductive decision-making and agency. Um, in the South African informal settlements where this, this trial was conducted. And then we'll have some closing remarks and reflections on where we go from here with this, with this new body of evidence from Emily Esplin, who is a social development advisor on violence against women and girls with the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, formerly known as DFID. Uh, so again, we'll have all the, the speakers present. Um, we'll take questions in the chat as we're going along, and then we'll have time for some Q&A at the end. So with that, I am going to hand it over to Rachel. Rachel, welcome. Thank you very much, Rose. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to be able to be here today to present um, some of the key findings from what works to prevent violence against women and girls. If you give me the next slide, um, this program we conducted between 2013 and 2020, and we worked through three components, generating knowledge on the prevalence and drivers of violence, what works in prevention, and the costs of violence prevention and the costs of inaction. We undertook across the three components the research in 15 countries in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. And these countries are displayed in red in the image on the right hand side of this slide. If I could have the next slide. So one of the first things we were looking at was to was the prevalence of violence and trying to extend our knowledge of an understanding of the prevalence in different settings. And we developed um, measures of violence that were standardized across different studies so that the data could be comparable. And in this slide, we presented data from a number of different studies on physical and sexual violence that women experienced in the 12 months prior to the research. And as you can see, there was a very wide range of prevalence reported, stretching from about um, one in five women to, in fact, two out of three women reporting having experienced this over that period. And in the dark uh, purple columns, I've highlighted the uh, fragile conflict and um, conflict affected settings. And you can see there are more of those towards the left hand side of the slide in the higher prevalence area. Um, the extreme right hand one, Afghanistan, didn't actually include sexual violence, so it's not strictly comparable. Um, but I think it's really interesting to show that there are two of the highest prevalence areas that were not conflict affected. And one was the group of women we enrolled from garment factories in our research in Bangladesh. And the other was the group of women we enrolled from informal settlements in South Africa. And women in Bangladesh actually also mainly lived in informal settlements. But what it shows you is that there are many areas within countries where overall the national prevalence may be lower. And in South Africa, our estimates are prevalence is quite a lot lower than this. But there are still 
um, subsets of the population. And in South Africa, 20% of women do live in informal settlements. So quite large subsets of the population where women may experience very much higher prevalences of violence. All of this shows that context is vitally important in understanding who's experiencing violence and therefore who we should be targeting in terms of our violence prevention interventions. Which are the population groups that are the highest priority? If I can have the next slide. Amongst these groups are women with disabilities and one of the things we were able to do through What Works was to expand our understanding globally about the experience of violence, particularly intimate partner violence amongst women and girls with disabilities. We ask questions routinely across our surveys using the Washington Group questions about disability and have been able to show in this analysis from seven studies across five countries that these women and girls were experiencing physical and sexual IPV at roughly twice the rate of women without disabilities. The next slide. So what this brings us to is a discussion around drivers of violence. And this is another area we're very pleased to have been able to extend our understanding. And this figure I'm presenting here um, sums in many ways the state of knowledge around drivers of violence in 2020. And this was captured by one of the papers and key briefs from What Works, which has summarized this updated knowledge. And I think it's uh, important to reflect on the fact that we have two groups of factors. We have structural drivers and we have individual and relationship level factors that intersect and drive intimate partner violence. Obviously, the most central structure driver is gender inequality, uh, patriarchal privilege and disempowerment of women, and the normalization and acceptability of violence, which is um, inseparably related to, um, to patriarchy. We also have shown the importance of poverty as a structural factor and driver of violence, including low levels of education and food insecurity. And not only do these structural five factors um, uh, intersect with each other to drive violence, but they also intersect with individual and relationship factors. And we've shown that within um, relationships, poor communication, relationship conflict responses are very important drivers of violence and amenable to change in interventions. Similarly, poor mental health and substance abuse and experiences of childhood neglect and abuse, including witnessing mothers being beaten, which seems to drive increased risk of victimization amongst women as well as um, perpetration amongst men. And I've mentioned the issue of disability. And I think one of the other key learnings from what works has been positioning on conflict and post-conflict within our overall understanding of drivers. And what we've shown is that these factors both increase the dr structural drivers of violence, both gender inequality and poverty, as well as impacting on the individual and relationship factors. And through this drive, this increased risk of women in conflict-affected settings and post-conflict settings experiencing violence. On the next slide. So one of the things we were doing in What Works, of course, was to build our understanding of violence prevention. And particularly, we were looking at intimate part of violence prevention. But we also looked at some forms of violence experienced by children, peer violence in particular, and in some respects at uh, non-partner sexual violence experienced by women. We evaluated four different types of studies. We were looking at community activism approaches to shift harmful gender attitudes, roles, and norms, gender transformative and social empowerment intervention approaches, prevention of violence against and among children, and couples and special groups. Next slide, please. We uh, looked at interventions that span different levels of the social ecological model and I think it's interesting, on this slide, we've positioned our different interventions and we've used a darker colour to show the ones 
that had more effect than the others. And in fact, most of the interventions that were shown to be more effective spanned uh, two of the levels of the ecological model. None of them cut across all of the levels. Um, and I think that's interesting and important to understand, much as we don't actually have to impact every driver of violence to be able to reduce violence, we don't have to impact every level of the social ecological model. Next slide. Our community activism approaches were tested in um, five different settings and they're shown here in their different parts of the world on this map. Next slide. These approaches work through community activists who are usually carefully selected, trained and supported volunteers and they're organized and deployed in community action teams or groups with appropriate supervision and support. Their work is supported by manuals and other materials to enable structured or guided engagement with the community, to challenge ideas and norms on gender relations and attitudes towards violence. Most of these interventions um, directly supported survivors or engaged couples who are known to have problems with IPV. And they often worked with local religious and traditional leaders and state actors such as the police, health and social services to strengthen responses to survivors. We found good evidence that the interventions using community activism to change gender attitudes and social norms can be effective in reducing violence against women and girls through multi-year intensive community mobilization. However, it was only the very strongly designed and implemented interventions that did achieve this. These are not an easy approach to violence interventions. They take prevention. They take a long time to um, show effect and they need to be very intensively supported. Next slide. Our second group of interventions we looked at were gender transform and economic empowerment interventions and as you can see again we evaluated these in a range of different countries in Asia as well as in South Africa. Next slide. These interventions, um, well the first one that we've all learned about was the image trial in South Africa combining gender transformative intervention with microfinance but in our studies we didn't look at microfinance we looked at a range of other economic empowerment interventions ranging from livelihood strengthening in South Africa to interventions that um, to, to assisted families to develop income generating activities in Nepal and Tajikistan. What we showed is that these interventions to work need to be built on a strong contextual understanding and we found emerging evidence that whilst the literature so far had been focusing on men, on women as the target of these interventions, in fact, the value of these interventions with poor and marginalized men was, was shown to us through our work. And what we saw was that the economic intervention may enable us to bring these men to the table, to being able to engage them on gender and power in a way that might not otherwise be possible. We also showed values of these interventions with families, particularly in very conservative settings. But to work, these interventions need to be sufficiently intensive. Uh, the quantum of economic empowerment needs to be meaningful and they have to be delivered by highly trained and supported staff. To give you an idea of the type of impact, you see in the graph on the right hand side the findings for reductions in violence shown um, uh, in Tajikistan in an, after an intervention that was uh, uh, applied within communities for 15 months. And in fact, this is one of the few examples in the literature where we have um, shown that the impact of these interventions can be sustained. The 30 month um, measure was um, taken 15 months after the intervention had no longer been supported within communities. And we see that not only overall did violence reduce dramatically for the men and women in the study, but it was sustained in this period beyond the end of the intervention. 
Next slide. So the third group of interventions we worked with were couples interventions. And these we looked at in Rwanda, Zambia, and in, um, and in India, and Nepal. Next slide. And what we showed is these can be very valuable interventions, and they particularly work with couples or families um, where the approach is economic and gender empowerment interventions. We've shown effect with substance abuse driven violence, with highly patriarchal and traumatized populations, and also where counseling has been an adjunct to social norms changed interventions. One of the key things we've learned though is these interventions are effective where the overall interventions address key drivers of violence and where there's a direct and over focus on building the relationship of the couple. And so the couple has to be a socially recognized unit for the interventions to actually be effective. Next slide. So the final group were children and we looked at interventions with children in Zambia, Kenya, Afghanistan and Pakistan. Next slide. And what we've shown is that interventions with children can be very effective in reducing violence experienced by children. They need to be the ones we evaluated worked when they empowered children and they needed to use age appropriate materials. We need to take into account the fact that children take time to process and learn ideas and the effective interventions were delivered over a long period of time. They need to be designed to address multiple drivers of violence and effective methods were participatory including a play-based, there's an example in this picture of the intervention in Pakistan. They built gender equality uh, provided relationship and communication skills and fostered positive interpersonal relations. Next slide. So I've addressed um, and highlighted some of the key features of uh, the design and implementation of more effective interventions. And at the end of what works, we produced a a document that reviewed all of our different interventions and tried to draw out what were the features of the design and implementation that differentiated between interventions that did and did not show evidence of working. And we have summarized these um, elements in one of our key flagship reports published this year. And what we came up with were basically eight features of design of interventions. And even though the interventions are quite different, as um, I've shown you, in fact, these features seem to cut across the different types of interventions. And the same goes for implementation, having the duration and frequency of programs optimized, optimized and very well selected and trained staff and volunteers. So if you press the, um, the, 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 that's right, this shows you the report and I'll refer you to our website to read more about this. Next slide. We produced a second flagship report and at the end of what works, we synthesized evidence from across the entire field, asking the key question about whether different interventions that have been evaluated using RCTs or quasi-experimental studies with control arms actually have shown a reduction in violence, perpetration or experience of violence. And we were able to find nearly a hundred studies. The literature we found was actually much larger than we thought it was going to be. And we were able again to drill down on the findings of the studies in this comprehensive review and to um, identify the ones that were and the design of studies that were shown to be effective, those that were shown to be promising, those where evidence seemed to conflict from well-designed studies and those where there wasn't any evidence of effect. And we've summarized this in our second flagship report. And what I think is really important for the field is that we identified nine different types of intervention, where there is more than one really well-designed 
valuation of a well-implemented study that actually has shown to be effective. And this essentially provides a repertoire for us in taking forward our work within communities. Uh, if you push the cursor again. Um, and these interventions are in a position to be adapted for new settings or for deeper use in their existing settings and for being taken and evaluated at scale. Next, next um, slide. So this is the report. And again, I refer, to, refer you for all of the detail to our website. Next slide. So to conclude, what we've shown through What Works is that violence against women and girls has a deep and enduring impact on women's lives, well-being and economies. But it's preventable and preventable within programmatic time frames. And that provides the impetus for us to be able to go out and raise money and to demand the implementation of programs that can make this fundamental change to the lives of women and girls. We've got a repertoire of interventions that are effective and that can be adapted and taken to scale. And we've shown that implement interventions that are robustly designed and implemented work, but this is a key feature and interventions that are not robustly designed and implemented, even if they follow one of the types of interventions that otherwise has been shown to be effective, don't seem to work. And so it's really important that we not only implement the right interventions, but we do the implementation and the design in the right way in order to be able to have effect. But we now know much more than ever before about what it is we have to do. And so we're positioned to make a really big difference to the lives of women and girls. The challenge for us is to go forward and to make it happen. So thank you very much today. And I want to acknowledge on the next slide um, all of our colleagues and partners who've been able to make this possible, as well as DFID for your funding for our work. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rachel, for that um, impressive overview and summary of research from the past seven years in 15 countries. Um, Obviously, there is a lot to unpack there, and some of the write-ups on the, the work that Rachel described, the links to those have been dropped into the chat box there, so um, you can certainly get more information from, from those briefs and reports. Um, but now we do have an opportunity to take a, a deeper dive into one of the studies that was part of this portfolio of work. Um, and to take us through that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Andrew Gibbs. And please, um, if you have questions for Rachel, go ahead and drop them in the chat and we will try to get to them during the discussion. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Rose. And hi to everyone. Um, so we're going to be talking about one intervention in particular, Stepping Stones and Creating Futures, which we delivered in urban informal settlements in South Africa um, in the past few years. So next slide, please, Francesca. So I guess this intervention came about for a number of reasons. Um, there was some very early work which showed incredibly high HIV prevalence and also experiences of IPV among young women and men in urban informal settlements. Yet at the same time, a number of reviews, including one which we did, showed despite this being a kind of key group to work with, there were very few effective interventions even address it kind of to address HIV or IPV. And some more recent reviews have continued to show that. So we really wanted to focus in on this kind of group with exceedingly high rates of violence. There's also, as kind of Rachel hinted at, no evidence about what happens when you include men in kind of economic strengthening interventions. And there's been lots of work by the World Bank and others about including men in economics. So we thought, given the drivers of kind of men's perpetration include economic um, poverty and marginalization, what happens when we engage them as well? So it's those three sets of work which kind of underlay our kind of the work we started to do. Next slide. So the intervention comprised of two um, different 
um, manuals. The first was Stepping Stones, which many of you will have heard about, which was developed by Alice Wellborn in the 1990s for use in rural Uganda, which had then subsequently been changed um, and adapted for use in South Africa by Rachel and colleagues um, in the early 2000s. And that's primarily focused on gender norms transformation around sexual health communication um, and relationship strengthening. To that, we added creating futures, which really focused on livelihood strengthening. So we didn't kind of teach people how to kind of do one particular job, but rather gave them skills um, to look at the context in which they live and how best to build a livelihood around it. In total, it's 21 sessions, each is three hours long, so just over 60 hours of contact time. When we recruit, we recruited men and women separately. Very few of them were in relationships with one another at the time. I think I, I just looked and there were about five who reported being in a relationship with someone else in the intervention. It's delivered by trained peer facilitators and very kind of participatory. Um, next slide, please. So these are just a couple of examples of the types of approaches we use. So there was very little didactic kind of lecturing. It was massively learned centered and participatory, getting people to really reflect on the lives they li live and how they can start in their context to navigate them. So lots of role plays discussions um, in small groups, often in very cramped spaces. So we delivered this in informal settlements. So often got somewhere, it's kind of little shacks that they're delivered in. Next slide, please. So to give you a little bit of sense of the communities, as Rachel said, um, exceedingly high rates of past year intimate partner violence. Um, also to kind of just flag the high rates of non-partner sexual violence, um, a third of women um, at baseline reported being raped by a non-partner in the past year, and that remained consistent across the three time points. You know, not unsurprisingly, given these incredibly challenging contexts, you know, driven by histories of poverty, gender inequalities, and kind of the legacies of apartheid, we also saw exceedingly high rates of depression and very low rates of work. Um, when we recruited, um, we had quite a young population. Everyone was over 18, but the mean age was just under 24. Um, okay, next slide, please. So to kind of just reflect, so we did a randomized control trial. So we randomly assigned groups to either receive the intervention immediately or to receive the intervention two years later. And so what we're going to be doing is looking at the outcomes at that two year point. So this is kind of a year and a half or a bit more after the intervention groups received their intervention. Next slide, please. So let's start with men. So what we did see is men self-reported perpetration of violence against women in general declined and also their overall outcome use. In this slide, you can see in the graph, um, the dotted line is the control group, which also there was a decline in the prevalence reported of perpetration, but we see a much steeper reduction um, in men's, uh, amongst uh, men in the intervention group. So we saw that for past year physical and sexual IPV, but economic IPV, we saw a marginal reduction in emotional IPV perpetration. And we also saw a marginal reduction in men's non-partner rape perpetration. Next slide, please. So along, okay. So what we didn't see, however, despite these kind of reductions in IPV, uh, perpetration. We saw no real impact on transactional sex, condom use in the past year or at last sex or any of the kind of other markers we had of sexual risk behaviour. Um, next slide please. But we also did see a significant improvement in men's livelihoods by a range of measures whether we looked at men's work in the last three months, work consistency over the last year, savings, um, both total and past month um, were all significantly improved. We did see an improvement in men's earnings in the last month, but that wasn't statistically significant, but it was a big proportion higher than the control arm. So we have this very cohesive set of results for men around improved livelihoods. Can we get the next slide, please? When we look at women, we're going to start with women's livelihoods. 
like the men's, we saw this very consistent patterning of results for women's work and earnings, where everything improved significantly. We saw it improve working in the past three months, improved past year work consistency, earnings increased significantly, as did savings. So again, as with the men, we got these really good, strong results showing um, improvements overall for livelihoods. Next slide, please. However, what we did not see for women, and because these aren't women in relationships with the men, but in relationships with other men um, in their communities, is any impact on violence experience. So there's absolutely no indication of a reduction in past year physical or sexual IPV or non-partner rape experience. We also saw absolutely no impact on past year transactional sex or condom use at last sex. Um, so we have to start thinking about why that was the case. Next slide, please. Okay, just to give you a little bit of a summary. So what we see for men is these consistent reductions in IPV perpetration and non-partner sexual violence. I think really important to say that these findings are really similar to the initial evaluation of stepping stones, which was seen in the, which was done in the Eastern Cape amongst a slightly younger group of school going um, young men um, in a rural community. So alongside reductions in IPV, we also saw reduced alcohol use. So what we now have are two kind of studies from South Africa showing stepping stones either are on its own or in combination with creating futures has this impact on men's perpetration. But we saw no impact on HIV risk. Next slide, please. For women, it's obviously a lot more complex. When we saw a strengthened economic position for them, we saw no, no impact on their experience of IPV. But conversely, we didn't see an increase in IPV or non-partner sexual violence. And one of the concerns with these kind of interventions is that as women get more economic autonomy and power, that it might lead to a backlash, but we didn't see that. I guess we've got three current hypotheses that we want to look at about why. Um, we saw no improvement for women's kind of IPV or HIV. One, despite these kind of improvements in economic outcomes, the absolute earnings for young women remained incredibly low. And so the idea that people can change their lives um, while still being incredibly poor may well be wrong. Um, the second assumption is that we're working with dyadic relationships. A lot of the really effective interventions which combine these economic interventions with gender transformative interventions for women kind of assume that they're working with the kind of couples, essentially women in a stable relationship with a man. And that's possibly not what we saw in these contexts. We also saw kind of massive levels of poor mental health, particularly depression. And to assume that women are able to start to kind of reorientate their relationships when they're still dealing with kind of depression and poor mental health might be a bit wrong and we might need to tackle that. Next slide, please. So in terms of programmatic recommendations, I think one of the big things we see is scale, need to suggest is the scaling up of stepping stones and creating futures, both young women and young men. It had a strong, consistent economic benefit for everyone. And for the partners of men, um, there would obviously be reduced violence. We also need to develop a much stronger understanding of young women's lives and the constraints to change that they face. So we can understand where are the opportunities to start to work to improve their lives. And I guess we need to think about how do we address women's poor mental health at the same time as addressing gender inequalities. Final slide, please. And just kind of to say it was a huge team, it wasn't just me, there was a huge team of us both at the MRC, a project in power, a fieldwork team, and really the participants and those involved in the trial. So thank you to everyone involved in it. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Andy. Wonderful presentation. Um, and, and speaking of scale up, there, there's a nice discussion happening in the chat right now about scaling up some of these um, interventions. So hopefully we'll talk more about that in the discussion. Uh, but for now, we're going to quickly transition over to Samantha, who is going to um, elaborate on some qualitative research that was conducted also as part of the Stepping Stones and Creating Futures trial. Samantha? 
Thank you. Thank you, Rose. And thank you to everybody for joining us today. And letting me share some of what came up in the qualitative research. Um, I'm going to be building on, Andy has talked about the bigger quantitative, and I'll now dive deep into young women's reproductive decision making, intimate partner violence and agency amongst 15 of these women. Next slide, please, Francesca. Thank you. Andy's talked us through the interventions already, so I won't touch on that and the evaluation. In terms of the quali qualitative aspect, um, we did do some work with men, but today I'm going to talk about the work we did with 15 of the women. So we followed them over an 18 month period. Um, intensely interviewed at three time points. We did in-depth interviews at baseline and 12 and 18 months post-intervention, 54 in total. Um, we also did photo voice at baseline and endline, and we did participant observations. So we got a lot of very rich data, and then we used inductive content analysis. All 15 of the women were currently in heterosexual relationships when we were working with them, and they tended to focus discussions on their most significant love relationships, although there were often additional relationships as well. Next slide, please. So Andy has already talked us through the environment, but I just want to remind us it's an incredibly difficult space to be living in. Gender inequality is incredibly rife. Patriarchal privilege is everywhere. Um, there is generalized violence across the informal settlements and across South Africa. Extreme poverty, very high unemployment, and very little prospect of employment. And this is prior to COVID, which has further limited prospects. Almost no services or housing, mobile population, a very difficult space to be living in. Next, please. So of the, who were these women? The 15 women at baseline were between 19 and 29 years old. None of them were in formal employment. Two had completed secondary school. Of the 15 women, 10 were mothers. Eight were mothers at baseline. Two had children during the research period. Of the five without children, three had had miscarriages in their life and two had never been pregnant. Amongst these women, they talked widely about uh, violence. 11 of them specifically spoke about emotional, physical, economic, and or sexual violence. And talk about controlling behaviors by their partners was very common from all of them. You've already seen in the baseline data from Andy that 65% of the bigger sample um, reported physical and or sexual MPV in the last year. Excessive drinking, drug use, partying was very common amongst these women. Um, and I emphasize the excessive. Um, extreme binge drinking, etc. At the same time, as Andy's talked about, many were very bored, very lonely, very depressed, um, and basically very unhappy. And a lot of them spoke about their challenging childhoods, um, speaking about neglect, speaking about their sadness as adults, about not being able to be raised by their moms, not living with their mothers, etc. And some of them spoke about rape and abuse as children. Next slide, please. So we wanted to use the lens of agency to explore the young women's lives in relation to reproductive decision making and intimate partner violence. So we began by interrogating the notion of agency and we interrogated it because it's widely used, often misused and often meaning very different things to very different people. So we adopted the definition by Kabir uh, where she speaks about agency as being the power to define one's own goals and act upon them. For the power within. Uh, if you can just press for the rest of the slide, please. Thanks. Um, in our work, we uh, have come across regularly the concept of distributed agency, which Campbell and Mannell talked about in a special edition in 2016. Um, and this approach really recognizes that women's opportunities are often highly constrained, especially in coercive settings challenging settings like these informal settlements. It's recognizing that women's experiences can be very constrained and are very different in different settings. And this approach of distributed agency emphasizes that agency includes, to quote uh, Campbell and Mannell, it includes small wins that are realistically achievable by real women in real situations. And for example, what they're referring to here is that women may adapt their behaviors to reduce RPV. They may not leave a violent relationship, but they may do something different to try and reduce that violence. They might find a friend or a sister or an auntie who can, they can speak to, to give them support. A um, number of the women talk about avoiding sex. 
or secret use of contraceptives as a way to control their fertility and their reproductive decision making. Importantly, this concept of distributed agency is acknowledged as being temporary. It's fluid, it's cyclical, it's not either or. We don't talk about women as, yes, she's agentic. No, she's got no agency. This agency comes and goes, it's situational. And these authors acknowledge the women's own values and objectives and their own understanding is, of what constitutes a good life is what we as researchers and programmers need to be thinking about. So it's in contrast to the notion of us coming in as researchers and policy makers and programmers and deciding what agency should look like and deciding what women's lives should look like and instead giving them the space to frame what they want their lives to look like. And they also speak very clearly about recognizing that agency sits on a continuum, a continuum of activism. And on the one end are your acts of survival and coping. And at the other end are your acts of open resistance and radical social change. And agency can sit across those and women's experiences can shift among, across that continuum as well. Next slide, please. So what is this reproductive decision making that we talk about? Um, there's lots of language for what I'm referring to and in purple, we're defining it for the purposes of this research process. And it's really decisions about parenthood. Decisions that include whether and when to be a parent, the number of children, the spacing of children, decisions around contraceptive use, fertility, etc. So the question was, did the women make reproductive decisions? These 15 women, were they making decisions? And what we find very clearly is that the teenagers, or 19, late teens, and the women through into their early 20s, that when they were teenagers through to their early 20s, and when they had not yet had a child, they paid very little attention to whether or not they conceived. Very little thought was given to whether or not they would become a mother, whether or not they would have a baby. Um, I've put two quotes here on the bottom left. So Oweto, who has one child, and she was 20 when the child was born, talked about, it's not a decision falling pregnant. I understand it as something that happens when the time comes. Stella, who doesn't yet have a child, said having a child will happen organically. I won't say to him, a partner, hey, let's have a child. No, it will just happen on its own. So having a child, becoming a mother, just happens. Next slide, please. However, this, this narrative and this conversation shifted as the woman grew older or after having a first child. So once they moved into their mid to late 20s or once they had a child, many of the women began to express and sometimes even act upon. Sometimes it was the beginning of the thought but not yet the action or they were acting on it. And it was a greater desire to control whether and when they conceived and delay further pregnancy. Pregnancy. So, for example, Entele on the bottom left talked about, so she's got a child already. She had her first child at 18. She's talking now, not now. I will think about it, having another child, only when I'm working. When I'm able to support and look after my children, I don't want my child to live the same life as me. She needs a better life. I want her to finish school. Tombi, who's already got one child, says you can have one child, but two is a mistake. No, the first child is okay. That's expected of you as a woman. More than one is too much. Where are all these children going to sleep? No, I think that's been irresponsible. So that's referring to more than one child. Next slide, please, Francesca. So we wanted to understand what was happening and we wanted to unpack why we seem to see the shift in attitude towards um, early motherhood and motherhood generally. And we unpacked the social norms and what was happening in South Africa. And what came across very strongly is that a dominant social norm in South Africa that is relevant here, which is a social norm that encourages young motherhood to prove fertility, which creates encouragement and pressure on the young woman to comply and to conceive. And the pressure comes from many sides, from families, friends, community, church, partners. It's pressure everywhere you look. There is a competing narrative against young motherhood, which maintains it's a sign of recent moral decay. And some of you may recognize the words of my ex-president in that statement. Um, but that's not a dominant normative view in these communities. Um, the dominant view is very much around having a child young to prove fertility. Furthermore, the young women's voices themselves are hardly heard in this narrative when you're reading the literature, which was another reason why we wanted to unpack what these women were saying about these experiences. Interestingly, you'll see the four photographs on the right when we did the um, photo voice work and we asked the women to talk about dreams and futures and plans, aspirations, they all photographed children. 
um, children and babies were in all of their pictures. Next slide, please. Um, briefly touching on contraceptive knowledge and use, um, it's inconsistent and inaccurate. There were a number of barriers that the women spoke about. Lack of knowledge, limited misinformation and myths, despite the fact that the South African schooling system has been addressing this for nearly two decades. People still don't understand a lot of basic knowledge here. Fear of being mistreated by healthcare providers. I think we've all heard about you go to the healthcare system to get contraceptives, you get yelled at, you shouldn't be having sex, you walk away with nothing. And the lack of appropriate options and poor access. Many women find it was just too hard to be consistent with hormonal contraceptives and use them. Even in some cases where, uh, in some cases the women's use contraceptives ineffectively even when they knew about it. And this was often around their ambivalence around whether or not they wanted to conceive. So when they were younger, even if they knew about contraceptives and had access, they may not be thinking about it, that first category of women. We saw a shift after women had had their first baby, and this is pretty consistent in the field. When you have your first baby, the nurse then tells you how to prevent a second pregnancy. Just very briefly, and Dawny spoke here about when talking about the Stepping Stones intervention, and she said the session she really loved was basically hearing about basic um, sexuality and reproductive health, um, understanding fertility, and that you need to look at expiry dates and condoms. She already had two children. Next slide, please. So this is my second to last slide. The big question we're looking at, well, one of the many questions was, so did this intervention reduce IPB and did it increase reproductive decision-making and agency? Just quickly, the, the box on your right reminds you what we mean by distributed agency. When we applied that lens, while Andy showed you that many women did remain in violent relationships, and many of these 15 women remained in violent relationships, we saw some really meaningful, important changes. We saw shifting expectations about partners and relationships, less tolerance for controlling partners, improved in new communication skills. We saw the women with new intentions to shift behaviors which they began to acknowledge as being negative behaviors, improved livelihoods, which Andy spoke about. Next slide, please. So just a few illustrations of this. Um, for instance, if you look at the example on the bottom, on the top right, um, where we saw a lot of resistance to controlling partners and women beginning to stand up for themselves. Nolavoyo came to photo voice session at 18 months and she said he must not tell us what to do. He had forbidden, her partner had forbidden her from coming to the session and she came anyway. And he also said she couldn't wear makeup and she wore it anyway. And she was telling us this with great pride that she was able to resist his controlling behavior even though she stayed with him. Um, we saw women, the left, the quote on the left, we saw improved communication. We saw a number of women becoming more strategic about when to approach and communicate with partners. A lot of talk about recognizing they've got new skills and they've learned that if he's drunk or she's drunk, it's not a great time to confront her partner about something um, because it often leads to violence. I won't go through the rest. Um, we saw a lot of secret contra contraceptive use as a way of controlling reproductive decision-making, with women doing it with a sense of power. I've chosen to secretly use contraceptives because I don't choose to talk to them about it. Last slide, please. So what does this mean? Recommendations for programmers, researchers, and policymakers. This is a tall order, but I'm suggesting, we're suggesting, in order to, in order to develop targeted, appropriate, and effective policies, services, and interventions. We really need to strengthen young women's reproductive decision-making and, re and if we want to reduce unplanned early pregnancy, and I emphasize unplanned early pregnancy, it's important that we understand what's going on in the community. So it's important to understand whether, when, and how young women make reproductive decisions and how agency and social norms influence these. We need to understand whether young women are even concerned about or thinking about motherhood and delaying pregnancy. When we began to realize that teenagers were not thinking about it, we looked at some of, you know, we began to reflect on whether our interventions were appropriately targeted. We need to understand the local social norms, the pressure that young women are under. If there, are, if there is a social norm around young motherhood and proving fertility, one needs to understand that and integrate it into any intervention. And finally, we need to understand how best to support agency strength, strengthening for young women because stronger agency is likely to be addressing reproductive decision-making and unplanned early pregnancy. And finally, please, last slide, just I wanna say thank you to everybody who supported this project. 
particularly the women who really worked with us over 18 months the facilitators who ran the sessions, Nawazi and Tini, who was the research assistant in the field for 18 months and the entire team and to UK Aid for funding it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Samantha, for that really rich presentation uh, and results and recommendations. Um, we are going to close out now with some remarks from Emily Esplin from um, what is formerly known as DFID. Uh, Emily, are you with us? I'm going to hand it over to you. Yes. Um, hi, Rose, and hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much um, for this opportunity to share the learning from our What Works program today. And thank you to Rachel, Angie, and Samantha for your important insights. Certainly for me, it's been really just so exciting that thanks to what works and to many other studies, I think as a field, we now have rigorous evidence that shows unequivocally that we can prevent violence against women and girls. And as Rachel said, we can see change within program timeframes. This doesn't have to take generations. Um, and increasingly, we know not only which interventions are effective, but also which elements are crucial for their success and Rachel touched on those. You know, so now I think we have the first generation of knowledge that we can act on and I think there's a huge opportunity and, a, and an achievement as well. Um, so with that really as my starting point I'm going to end with just some brief reflections on the value of the knowledge that we now have, how we use this opportunity and, and where we go from here and I'm going to make just four brief points to leave uh, lots of time for the discussion. The first is that I think we need to leverage the evidence that we now have as a field to really shore up political support, momentum and funding around prevention and use this to expand investment in those approaches that we know, when done well, as Rachel said, have the potential to really transform women's lives. And certainly in DFID, this evidence has just been so powerful in enabling us to make the case that prevention works that we can see change within program timeframes. And this has really helped to mobilize big money behind this agenda. At the same time, of course, we need to recognize that evidence alone is, is not enough to affect change. And that we need to be, I think, very smart and strategic about communicating this in ways that build the empathy and really the outrage needed to spur action. Um, and I know there'll be many in this audience that are very experienced in doing just that. So you know, please do use this evidence to support your own advocacy efforts. The second priority that I see in terms of putting this evidence to, to base to work is using it to refine our prevention efforts. And as others have said in the chat, to really start to test how we can adapt and scale these proven or promising social change innovations but in a way that doesn't compromise their quality, effectiveness, and ethics. And recognizing that that is gonna be hard to do well. We do now have proof of concept for a handful of effective small scale interventions to prevent violence, but still I think quite limited understanding of how complex social change interventions can be scaled. Um, and, and as was mentioned in the chat, I think CUSP have done some really important thinking in this area, which is hugely valuable for us. I think this, challenge has to be one of our priorities for the next generation of knowledge. Um, and certainly in, in DFID, now FCDO, we are very interested in testing how we can both um, take these small scale social change innovations to larger scale, as well as adapting large scale sector programs or platforms that are already operating at scale to optimize their impact on the prevention of violence against women and girls, whether that's education, social protection, livelihoods, um, health. You know, this is often where the big money is. And I think these sectors often see violence against women and girls as a risk. So I think our, our challenge really is to reframe this as an opportunity. And I think we have the evidence to do this. My third point um, is that while What Works has shown that we can prevent violence, for me, it's really also been a reminder of how difficult this work is and how hard it is to do it well. And certainly, again, for me, some of the most productive learning came from reflecting on what hasn't worked in quite the way we'd hoped or expected and why, and how we can use this to refine and strengthen the field. Um, and as Rachel touched on, while some of this has been about intervention design, a lot has been about implementation, you know, about the how as well as the what. Um, and in particular, Again, as Rachel touched on um, in her slides, having 
carefully selected, experienced, well-trained, supported facilitators or community activists really prove key to the success of this work in our portfolio. And I'm sure this comes as no surprise to many people on this call. Um, but I think this key piece is often overlooked and inadequately resourced. And I hope that the learning from what works can be used to help to shift this. Then lastly, but I think crucially, um, while there's been an incredible expansion, I think, over the last decade in global knowledge and evidence on violence prevention, I think it's really important that we avoid an over-reliance on the existing but still quite limited evidence base and on only replicating uh, the most recent tried and tested models. There are, we know, many research questions still to answer, and I think um, Andy and Samantha's presentations really um, made that very clear. So I think continued investment in innovation and experimentation will be really important to identify new solutions, but also to hone the solutions that we now have to continue to move the field forward. Um, I'll give just a couple of examples. You know, even our most effective interventions under What Works only succeeded in reducing levels of violence against women and girls by around 50%, leading really very high levels of residual violence. So you know, in, in FCDO, we want to know what different combinations, intensities or duration might help move us closer to zero. Similarly, you know, we still know very little about the sustainability of our impacts over time. I think the study that Rachel spoke about in Tajikistan is, is one exception to that. And we're really keen to come back and evaluate some of our most effective interventions in three years or so down the line to better understand whether these impacts have endured. Similarly, we now have a much better understanding of the prevalence, nature and drivers of violence against women and girls during situations of conflict and humanitarian crisis. And this was a particular focus of the work of component two of the What Works programme. But robust evidence on what works to prevent and respond to violence in these settings is still quite limited. So in FCDO, we want to test how we can adapt proven interventions from more stable settings to work the context of conflict and humanitarian crisis. So these are just a few of the areas that we want to focus on moving forward. And last year, the UK announced a successor to What Works, which is a new significant 67 and a half million seven year program that will invest in innovation in these areas and others, and also in systematically carefully testing how we can adapt and expand some of the most promising small scale social change innovations. Um, this I think will be the largest investment by any single donor government in multi-country research and practice on the prevention of violence against women and girls. Um, and I, I noticed in the questions there was um, a point about support to NGOs to scale programs effectively. I mean, this program is very much um, intending to co-design um, the scale interventions between NGOs and others with um, experts in the consortium with a lot of technical support and to have a really strong research component that enables us to learn what works and, and how we do do this at scale, as I say, without um, without undermining impact or um, the ethics of this work. So the programme's currently under procurement. I'm happy to answer any further questions about that and we'll launch early next year. So uh, we're certainly very excited about the opportunity to contribute you know, with many others towards building the next generation of knowledge and practice. Um, I hope to move us closer towards ending violence against women and girls once and for all. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Emily. And thank you to all of our presenters for really wonderful presentations and taking us through um, really what's just been an incredible uh, body of work over the last seven years that has uh, really expanded tremendously the evidence base and our knowledge about what works to prevent violence against women and girls. And yeah, as, as Emily noted, like incredible work still remains to, to figure out how to take these um, programs to scale, um, but really encouraging results. And we have lots of really great questions coming into the chat. We're going to get to some of them. But before we do that, we want to get some quick reactions from, from those of you who have joined us today. So um, um, bear with us. Uh, we have a quick polling question for you. So um, Francesca, do you mind pulling up the first question for folks? Okay. 
So here you go. I want, I, I would love for everyone um, joining us today to uh, respond to this first question here. So which of the following best describes how you feel after hearing today's presentations? So we've got reaction here, inspired, informed, surprised, or confused. So take a, just a quick few seconds to respond to that first one. And then the second question is, are there ways in which the evidence presented today can inform your work, yes or no? So just take another quick seconds to, to answer the polls. Okay. And Francesca, are we able to load the results? Great, okay, so vast majority of you feel um, better informed after the presentations and a third of you inspired and uh, fortunately only 1% confused. Um, and an impressive 98% of you feel there are ways in which the evidence presented today can, in, can inform your work. So um, I think that is wonderful. Um, and I do wanna just, if, if there's anyone who would like to share, maybe one or two people who have some very concrete thoughts on ways in which the evidence presented today um, would inform your work going forward, um, please feel free to hit the raise your hand button and, and we'd love to hear from a couple of you in the audience. Is there anyone that would be willing to, to jump in? I don't see any hands yet. You can also share your thoughts in the chat. Okay, I don't think people are feeling brave. <laughs> um, but please do share your, share your thoughts in, in the chat um, about how you, so it's, um, to repeat the question, it's how you um, envision being able to use the evidence presented in today's webinar um, in your own work. Uh, and so while you're thinking about that and, and dropping your responses into the chat, Let's go to some of the questions that we had um, from people as we were going along. Um, and uh, Jill, I, Jill Gay had a question about next steps. Jill, I hope that that was adequately covered by, by Emily in her closing response and her closing remarks. But um, Emily, maybe starting, yeah, we'll st I start with a question that came in towards the end while you were presenting. Um, about how we can convince funders that we need to invest in good facilitators and community activists first and then put in place the interventions. Um, and she further comments that funders want to start with interventions right away so we have results in the first year. Uh, so it's difficult to screen and, screen and adequately train and support those activists and facilitators. Any, any thoughts on that that you'd like to share, Emily? I mean, I agree. It's a real challenge. It's something that, that you know, we had a real challenge at even internally when we were designing the What Works Successor program, you know, to, to preserve the time for an adequate inception phase um, to build those critical relationships before you know, and to do the co-design work rather than having that really uh, tight pressure at the very beginning. I mean, I think what I would say is um, there, uh, Rachel's made this point as well in the chat, there is evidence that you could draw on from the flagship report, the two flagship reports that we put out, I think particularly the first one, um, which is in the chat, which shows the importance of having the, putting in the time for that in order to get effective outcomes in terms of the prevention of violence against women and girls. So um, I, I hope that that evidence will help. And we do have some quite sort of specific steers, particularly into some of the community mobilization interventions um, around um, the need to be really thinking about, you know, minimum three to five year intervention spans and the risk of not seeing an impact if you try and compress um, the timing too much. So I think there is there are recommendations around the importance of adequate inception and also adequate timeframes, particularly in terms of community mobilization work, where obviously you know, those facilitators have such a critical role and we need the time for the diffusion. Um, it, it's not something that can be done within 
a very short time frame, but um, others may have views on that. Great, thank you, Emily. Um, let's move on, Andy, we have a question for you. Um, the question is, how are you considering women's relative lack of power to unilaterally transform their relationships and the impact of social desirability on men's self-reports of violence perpetration as you analyze and interpret the results from, from your RCT? Thanks, yeah. I think that's a really good question. Um, I think in terms of women being able to affect change in their relationships, I think it comes off a lot of work that has previously been done. I guess the kind of foundational study which showed this was the Image Project, which combined microfinance and kind of group work for women alone. And there it showed women could indeed transform their relationships and there was a 55% reduction. And economists have thought about this a lot, about kind of dynamics within the household and ways in which power can be shifted by women alone. I guess in our context and amongst the young women in informal settlements, maybe this isn't the case, but more widely in the broader fields, there isn't, you know, it's been shown in a number of different projects, working with women alone can work. Obviously in certain contexts like Tajikistan, in or one of our other projects in Afghanistan where kind of households are much more kind of powerful than in other contexts potentially it's much better to work with a household rather than individual women but in the right moment in the right space working with women alone is important men's self-report yeah uh, definitely there are problems with social desirability um, but I think what we know from working with couples and looking at couples reports, so women's experiences, men's perpetration, men will report lower, but the same patterns are seen. So in Rwanda, where um, one of the studies worked, men reported less violence perpetration than women um, in a couple, but the same patterns of reduction are seen. So we're not too worried about kind of the patterns that we've seen, but definitely the prevalence would be lower. So hopefully that answers that. Great, thank you. Yeah, not an easy question. <laughs> um, let's see, Qu Samantha, we have a question for you. Um, so someone asked if you have any qualitative findings on, so most of the, the findings you presented were from your qualitative research for, with women. Um, and so are there any qualitative findings on men's attitudes and perceptions of IPV in the context of relationships they view as transactional? So that should actually be directed back to Andy. Um, I didn't work on the men's call at all, but we did do some qualitative research and Andy was involved in that. It was led by Laura from Project Empower, but Andy, you can probably comment on that more effectively than I can. Yeah, um, thanks. Yeah, I think we've got some interesting sets of work because one of the things I didn't show is that men's gender attitudes didn't change when we measured them, but the qualitative um, evidence shows a much more complex set of patterns around changes um, around emotions and about ways in which men engage with ideas of communication and conflict resolution. Um, so we don't have particular to kind of, in kind of um, relationships men viewed in more transactional ways. Um, but we do have this broader sense that maybe, and you know, this is a big criticism of our own work. We didn't see a massive kind of fundamental shift in kind of new men appearing who are fundamentally something different, kind of much more gender equitable. But we did see men starting to grapple with this and starting to grapple with emotions and what it means to be in relationships. So, you know, we have got limits to our interventions. We're not seeing brand new men emerging, but we are seeing men who are much more reflective and engaging. Um, so it's a complex picture. It's certainly not, you know, the be all and end all and the only thing that needs to get done in this field. Great, thank you. So Rachel, uh, a couple of questions for you, and we'll start with one that that came in a bit earlier in the in the webinar. But 
wondering if, if the data show um, violence against women and girls reducing among certain age groups more than others. So for example, younger children versus adolescents versus young adults. Thanks. Um, it's interesting. The work we did with children, almost all of it was with children who were in the same age band. And so we didn't actually look at that. And also we were looking at um, peer violence as the outcome because um, the, particularly in places like Pakistan and Afghanistan, you can't actually study dating violence when you're talking to 12 and 13 year olds um, because the cultural context is so completely different from a country like South Africa. Um, but we did look across the adult women studies at whether age made a big difference either to the effectiveness of interventions or to the prevalence of violence. And we were quite surprised to see that overall it did not make a very big difference. And this surprised us because previously um, we had been led to believe that um, from other studies and the literature in general that um, younger women experienced very much more violence than older women. We didn't have a very wide age range amongst the women we were looking at, but we were certainly looking at women between the ages of 18 and, and 50, and in, in some cases above 50. Um, but for the greater part of that age range, there wasn't a huge difference in the countries and settings that we were looking at. And I think that there are many differences in different global contexts, but um, we didn't find that age made a big difference. Okay, and while we have you uh, on video, another question for you. Somebody noted that uh, they were struck by the finding that food security was a factor in IPV. And do you have any data to suggest that uh, that has anything to do with access to water and sanitation as well? Well, we were looking at food insecurity as a measure predominantly of poverty because there are many, many different ways of measuring poverty. But if you want to look at it across cultural contexts, I mean, it's been our experience that in low and middle income countries that really food insecurity is a very good indicator. And we saw that in the work that we were doing through What Works as we have done in different previous pieces of research in a wide range of different global regions. We, in most settings, did not look at access to, uh, to water and sanitation. And I mean, it was really because we were trying to be quite streamlined in our approach. The one setting that was different that did ask about water and sanitation was one study that we conducted in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And that was with um, an intervention that, and the study was being run by Tear Fund and Heal Africa. And in that setting, we did see that there was some patterning between women's exposure to non-partner sexual violence and the location of water sources. And what we were looking at was clearly um, an example of women who were becoming uh, vulnerable because of the practices that they had around um, uh, around sourcing water and so it really did show that um, that there can be an important link in some settings but it wasn't something that we looked at overall. Thank you. Um, Andy and Samantha let's go back to you um, so and we'll start with I think probably you, Andy. So there's a question to, to hear more about the economic empowerment program that engaged poor and, and marginalized men, and specifically what the men received in these programs and, and if women were engaged at all. And then um, after you address that, perhaps we can go then to Samantha. There was a request to unbundle this concept of women's agency a bit more. And, and to talk about uh, what support women were offered to, to try and increase their agency. Cool, yeah. So creating futures. Um, the intervention was the same for both women and men. Um, 
and it was 10 sessions. Um, and so what it did, it was based around kind of the five capitals of livelihoods, which I can't remember, but include kind of social capital, economic capital, um, land, which I forget what the term is, but really it encouraged people to think in the context in which they live, um, how can they make a livelihood and make a pattern? I think a lot of what we found from the qualitative is it not only helped people to think about the opportunities and how to maximize those opportunities through very kind of what we might think of quite basic stuff such as CVs kind of formatted for each opportunity, but also to make a plan around the options. So lots of people, lots of young men, lots of young women had very kind of unrealistic expectations given the huge constraints in South Africa of what a good kind of work was. Um, and a lot of the work of creating futures was to get them to think concretely about what is available to them right now and to build up a plan at which they can action immediately, which would lead in six months or a year to something which they might be looking forward to. So a lot of the qualitative work really showed those kind of little steps going forwards and building. Um, so we didn't provide them with anything in terms of financial resources. Um, they just got the sessions and a little workbook to kind of help them plan out a few things. But beyond that, it's a kind of standalone intervention. Um, we didn't involve their female partners, although again, qualitatively, a few of the men talked about engaging their female partners. Thanks. Samantha? Thank you. Yes. Um, so when we're talking about agency, we're talking very much, I mean, like I said, at some point, it's a very contested term. It's widely used and used very differently. Um, so when we were talking about building agency, we initially, six, seven, ten years ago, we're having this discussion around what do we mean? What are we trying to do? Um, is this about working with women to create radical feminists who will stand up and run out of abusive relationships. What does this agency look like? What does it need to be? And that's why we were unpacking this question of how do the women themselves see it, which is Kabir's point around, you know, what do the women think? Distributed agency is around start with the women, find out how they set their goals, find out what they want and see what's significant to them. So when we start looking at it like that, we start seeing lots of agent, agentic actions. And in the literature, there's a lot of critique around what's called the action bias. You know, you're only agentic if you leave the violent report, relationship or report the perpetrator to the police or the uncle or somebody. Um, and we, we were rejecting that action bias and saying, no, let's look at what the women want. So what we did to support them was very much what Andy's outlined around the stepping stones and creating futures. Um, so creating futures was the livelihoods work which Andy talked about um, and we did that because there's the argument around there's no point in empowering women but they still can't actually feed themselves and their children and what came out very strongly from the women was that the livelihoods intervention did huge things for them particularly the small things around what do you put in your CV the one woman got herself a job and she got it because never before in her CV had she included previous work experience she didn't know that was relevant. She put it in her CV and she got a job at the local mall in the shoe shop. A um, couple of people talking about not realizing, uh, understanding now how to conduct themselves in an interview, what to wear, what to say, what not to say. Um, so that really gave them a foundation for being able to get that job, even in incredibly hard situations. In terms of the stepping stones, we focused a lot on two things, the content and the methods, both of which were focused on agency because the content was focused on um, communication skills, relationship skills, how to engage differently with people, how to set your goals. Um, goal setting is so fundamental for agency. You know, what do I want and how do I get there and can I do it? Um, but in the absence of hope and living in an incredibly impoverished, hectic community, often goal setting and dreaming is not there. Um, so we did a lot of work around goal setting and dreaming, which the women already responded to. Um, and then the communication skills and the relationship skills are critical. I mean, we're not talking about, you know, Stephen Covey's seven habits. We're talking about what's really meaningful in a relationship to change tension, 
to shift what your expectations are. And the methodologies and the content also got women to reflect. So the participatory methodologies make you start thinking about yourself and the self-critical reflections that you're doing and the ability to critique and the ability to reflect is fundamental around strengthening agency. So it's a combination of the skills they've got alongside the methodologies to be reflective. Uh, I, examples, I'll give one example because I know I'm going on too long now. Um, so we had the women who would have been on the far extreme of the continuum, the women who really felt powerful, left a violent relationship, moved away to a community where she felt she could you know, become a stronger individual, not be held down by her previous relationships and return to school. But we also just saw a lot of smaller things. The women who used to always get very drunk and then handle the issues decided not to. She slept at her house when she was drunk and went to talk to him the next day when it's calm and nobody's feeling drunk and aggressive anymore. Um, let me stop there. I can elaborate if there's more, but let me stop for now. That was great, Samantha. Thank you. Um, we are approaching the end of our time, and I might I have one last question that I think I will um, pitch to Rachel. Um, Again, you know, the, the results coming out of this, this body of work are just so impressive um, and encouraging. Uh, and I just, Rachel, wanted to ask you to elaborate a little bit on um, it's one of the key takeaways or conclusions from your presentation was that, you know, yes, these, it is possible to prevent violence. It can be done in programmatic timeframes, but interventions must be robustly designed. And I was wondering if you could just elaborate a little bit more on what, what exactly you mean by robustly designed. Well, we drew out 10 features of the design, I guess eight features of the design and two of the implementation that we would say constituted robustness. And the, if you look at our flagship report, we show how these were features more successful interventions that we evaluated in each category and how they were generally not features of less successful interventions. Although there were a couple of the less successful interventions that had some of these features that we were quite surprised at the lack of impact. And I think again that points to the word of caution that Emily um, gave us when she mentioned that we really have no room for complacency around thinking that just because something looks good and feels good if we put it out there that it actually will work because it isn't that easy to stop violence and so we really do need to be careful how we put things together but I think that um, it's it's really important that we think about the design it's really important that we have um, sufficient intensity interventions you know quick quick interventions don't work short interventions don't work take time and um for the men need to pull relationship skills and um they need to be given a chance to go out there and practice and um and experiment with it, um new ideas and new skills in order to be able to consolidate them and that's really this importance of experiential learning um the reason why short interventions are not showing effect we also have shown how important it is for interventions to have participatory approaches again so that men can really and women can explore what they think of gender, explore how they can apply it to their lives, what it really means for them. And interventions need to be um, properly put together and manualized and documented in order to be effective. And that's not just about the magic of the page, but it's about the um, process that intervention developers go through in order to be able to take the member to that point. And obviously, very important other aspects of intervention development, which requires, you know, peer input, peer review, and so forth, all of which are much, much harder if interventions aren't documented. And it's much, much harder to systematize interventions and train people to deliver them with fidelity and to adapt them for different settings and so forth if they're not sort of thoroughly put together. Theories of change underpinning interventions are absolutely critical and all of the effective interventions were based on um, fundamentally on gender empowerment as being 
um, one of the fundamental areas of change that needed to occur in order to prevent violence. And I think that's a really important message because there are schools of thought in the world that develop interventions that are not based on gender empowerment and building gender equality as um, fundamental um, in terms of addressing violence. I think it's really important that um, we understand that we haven't there isn't really evidence that those interventions work very well. And um, it's really important to think about whether you're working with women, whether you're working with men. And some of these discussions we've just been having about women's agency really are critical because much as there is element that w uh, in evidence that with the right elements of interventions, um, that women can sometimes be held in order to um, bring about changes that reduce violence in their lives um, without male partners being and men being involved in the interventions. We've also seen incredible value and in involving men in some settings where it's very clear that we get um, a substantial added value to the point where interventions don't work so well with them on their own. And Andy's shown that stones creating futures and so I think it's really important we think through these different elements of interventions and we reflect and build robust interventions and again if I can link this into funders you know we're all concerned about um, funders that have pushed back on intervention length you know the message being that's great your 30 hour 20 hour intervention has been shown to be effect now effective now cut it down to five to ten hours and let's you know you go and implement it we'll fund that and we really need to use again evidence that we've pulled together from what works and our key reports to push back on that because um there isn't any point in developing good evidence about what does work to prevent violence only for owners to come along and say that's lovely give us the you know 30% um, duration version of that intervention and that's what we're going to fund and so um, we, we you know I hope that we've been able to produce key resources that will be really useful to women's organizations on the ground in order to engage robustly with funders and push back because I think that that's something that's really critical. Thank you so much, Rachel, and I think that's an excellent way to bring our webinar to a close today. Um, again, I do want to just thank all of the presenters uh, for, for sharing your insights, your lessons learned, your findings from this impressive body of work. Um, and, I, and I want to thank our participants as well. Many of you shared ways in which you imagine or are planning to use this evidence in your work going forward. And that's um, you know, really the heart of, of where we are right now is making sure that these research investments actually get translated into meaningful policy and practice. And so whether you're an advocate or a program implementer or a researcher uh, or a funder, I hope that you will consider how the, the results from this work can um, inform your work going forward. And there were many links dropped in the chat to where you can get more information um, on the results coming out of this program. We certainly were only able to scratch the surface here in 90 minutes. So please do take um, a, a deeper look into those resources. Uh, and lastly, we will we have recorded the webinar and we will be sharing that along with the slides. So. Um, so uh, you can share those with colleagues who may not have been able to join us today. But, but thank you all so much for joining us and we look forward to seeing you at the next GBB Task Force event. Thank you and bye. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you all, bye.